all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. That's our mission. Jesus made it clear we are to go. That word go is an important part of the mission. Uh, in every church, we have to make sure that uh, we are outward focused because it's very easy to be inward focused as a church. But Jesus said, go ye therefore. You Amen. are to look outside and, and reach those who are lost. Now, if you were to ask a church, um, what should you be? Should you be outward focused or inward focused? Well, the answer really is both, right? We should be both. We should be outward focused and inward focused. But uh, one of the problems is that when a church decides to be both outward focused and inward focused, the tendency is always to default to being inwardly focused. Yeah. And it's about us, and you try to carry on a, pro a program that caters to our needs. But um, a healthy church is a church that is always putting themselves in the position of someone who is out there. Amen. What about a visitor who comes? Um, are we, as a church, meeting the needs of those who are out there? Or are we simply trying to rally around our particular needs and we feel that this is a friendly church because after all we're friendly with each other? And I'm thankful that here in the Warrington Church I sense a real warmth and uh, I see the Spirit of God here. But uh, it's very important that we always make that a priority to put the major portion of our energy, more than 50%, say at least 60%, in trying to keep outwardly focused and being intentional about that in our decisions and in our board meetings and all that we do. Let me just say something uh, briefly about uh, values. Uh, uh, the values that we have as a, um, as a, as a church, uh, there are several and we can build on this. Um, spirituality is a very important value. Uh, there is a book um, that um, Pastor Mark and I have uh, studied. I had this by my bedside for quite a while. It's called Surprising Insights from the Unchurched by Tom Rayner. And uh, there have been those who tried to figure out how to have a growing church. And they've uh, asked a question to those who are not attending church, uh, what would you want in a church? And they kind of tabulate all of this information. And uh, then they try to create a church based upon their findings, which I think is not uh, a healthy way of going about it, because basically what we want to do is find out what Jesus says the church should be. We want to take marching orders from Jesus. Uh, in the upper room, I don't think they were passing around a survey, uh, but we want to find out what is a healthy church and to establish that on a, a firm foundation. And there have been those who create these mega churches, and uh, they're trying to get a lot of people there. And uh, there was one church that took an honest assessment of itself and found out that after uh, 10 years of doing what they were doing, that they actually failed because they weren't creating healthy disciples of Jesus. They might have had a lot of numbers. And our goal is not to make a healthy uh, a mega church. We want to have a church that is healthy and that uh, we have real disciples of Jesus who love and live the truth of Jesus and want to uh, prepare for his soon coming. But what they did in this particular book was something a bit different. They uh, looked at those who ended up uh, at one time were not attending church, but then ended up attending church. And they wanted to find out what was the thing that they were looking for uh, that really made the difference and helped them to make that uh, transition to uh, actually being involved in a church. And they uh, came up with a number of uh, of things, uh, what was on the, the list that made the least amount of difference was the location, um, worship style, and music. Some churches think, that, okay, if we just put all our energy in making this very uh, uh, entertaining and so forth, that that would make a big difference. That wasn't, uh, that was way down on the bottom of the list. Now, that doesn't mean that this is not important. We should do what we do with, with excellence, but um, that was not the thing that uh, convince a person to uh, choose this particular church and get back involved in ministry. Uh, you got other ministries, children and youth, Sunday school, uh, relationships with other than family, a sense of God's presence in the church, family members attend, someone from the church witness to them, other issues or friendliness of members. There were two, two that ranked the highest on the list. 
and they had to do with um, the doctrines of the church and uh, the preaching of the church was the, was the message a biblically oriented message. These were the things that people were looking for. And here we are in a, in a secular society and the society that we're living in knows very little of what, what, what is sacred and holy. And people are looking for relationship with God and they want to have a meaningful uh, relationship with Him and they want to know that the Bible has the answers and they're seeking for um, biblical truth. And that is one of the, uh, the values that we want to have right from the start. And, uh, whoops, um, we just, we want to have a, a spirituality, um, not necessarily the best car in town, <laughs> but a spirituality. We want to do what we do with excellence. And when we move down to that valley, I think that's a, kind of an upper class uh, uh, area and I've got to remember to keep my shoes shined and so forth. We, we don't want to do anything that would be an impediment to someone seeking for the truth. We want to have an environment where the Spirit of God can speak to people and we're doing what we do with excellence so that uh, we're uplifting Christ and giving our best talents uh, for Him. We want to have a sense of, of unity uh, always follow that Matthew 18 principle so the enemy doesn't come in and try to fracture the, uh, the spirit of God in our church. But uh, we want diversity, but, uh, but we want a unity within that diversity. Diversity doesn't mean uniformity. We, uh, we value the diversity in a congregation because God equips different people with different talents and gifts and perspectives. And as we work that through, that's what creates a, a healthy uh, church. And of course, things like integrity, and again, this outward focus. These are things that we will uh, talk uh, more about later as we kind of hammer this out. And we'll try to uh, define that mission uh, in our own way. It'll say basically what Jesus said about Matthew 28, go ye therefore. But we'll come up with a, uh, um, a phrase to describe our mission that's kind of tailored to the needs of this project and uh, speaks to this particular situation. Well, there's a lot more we can say here, but I'm going to pass this on to uh, Pastor Mark, and he's going to share about the vision that we have for uh, for this uh, project. I think if you can turn this on, I think I'm on number two here. Okay. I like to. Well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. They'll have to turn my mic on because my voice is not... Uh, sufficient today. So maybe, Tommy, can you slip down and be sure this mic number two is on? And I'm going to come down closer to you. I rarely have any problems with my voice, but um, my immune system was low because I've been traveling so much and then I've done a lot of preaching and teaching in the last few days. So any assistance Tommy can give me, I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you, brother. I'll tell you, that's why you need a team. One person speaks and the other person reinforces the voice. <laughs> Pastor Bob and I met 35 years ago. I was an evangelist in southern New England in Connecticut. We were holding meetings in New Haven, Connecticut. Bob had been uh, a young man who had come to Christ, he was now in his mid-twenties, and he was a Bible worker, and he came to work in our team. And we've known one another through the years, and I can't tell you how delighted I am that Bob and Joni are with us, and Tini and I are just absolutely delighted that we believe that God is going to do something special in this area. Yeah. Pastor Bob talked about a New Testament model for church, and for a few moments this afternoon, I want to do two things. One is, what did the church look like in the New Testament? And I'll just summarize that quickly. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about the project that we have um, believed that God is leading in here. Let your mind go back 2,000 years. In the Roman Empire, there were 180 million people. 180 million people lived in the Roman Empire. When the disciples accepted the challenge that Jesus gave, that Pastor Bob read, go you therefore and teach all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, there were about 520 that met on the hillsides of Galilee after the three and a half year ministry of Jesus. When we come to the upper room, there's 120 that met in the upper room. 
So 120 people took Christ's command to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit seriously. If you take 120 and you compare that to 180 million people in the Roman Empire, that is one Christian for every 1.4 million people in the empire. Wow. Now the task would seem incredibly overwhelming. One Christian for every 1.4 million people in the Roman Empire. The task seems impossible. Um, today there is one Seventh-day Adventist for every 222 people in the world. Go back to the first century. One to every 1.4 million people in the empire. The critics could have said, this is impossible. The skeptics could have said, no way. You could have thought of all the reasons why you couldn't reach the Roman Empire with the gospel. The Roman Empire was a thrill-jaded, morally twisted uh, society. It was a sex-centered society. It was a materialistic society. It looked like the gospel couldn't penetrate it. But 120 people believed the promise of God. They opened their hearts, and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. And when you look at the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 are baptized. In Acts chapter 4, another 5,000 are baptized. By the time you come to Acts 5, you have 15 to 20,000 believers. Uh, you come to Acts 6, 7, and 8, and there's multitudes. The word in the Greek is myriads, tens of thousands are 